Good Monday morning from freezing Alberta. It's like minus 40 with the wind chill. Minus 40 Celsius. I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit. For all my uh, friends to the south. But yeah, it is just crazy cold. And it's going to be like that all week. But we, knew, we know it comes. Here in Canada, we're used to it. We know every year we're going to get a cold snap sometime during winter. Like a real cold snap. I'm talking like minus temperatures like beyond like we're close to minus 40 like literally with the wind chill chill factor on it it's nuts okay it's monday i'm in my garage i have a heater here i'm kind of bundled up which is good staying warm is important and you know i thank god so much that i have a beautiful home warm home with my family my wife and son it's great and i am thankful for that his provision you know, keeping us going, keeping us here. And we all can, can appreciate that. Even the smallest, finest thing like that, a warm home. Very, 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 very awesome that we have this and that God provides it. Okay, this morning, I got a little bit of a nose thing going on this morning. Allergy, whatever you want to call it. So you'll have to excuse that. <clears throat> I spent the other night with my brother Rick. He's a year older than me, and he finally got his own place in Calgary. Now, that's about 30 kilometers away from uh, where I live. But uh, he needed a place, and he was living on the streets. It's another example. Uh, he was actually living in homeless shelters. He's a year older than me. He's 55, and he had a falling out with his, his son, and he ended up on the streets. He has a job, and he kept his job during that time he was on the streets, but uh, I'm, so, I'm so thankful that he found a warm home and got a place. You know, I went over there, and uh, he's not a, a solid believer. He does believe he's coming into an understanding, a bit of an understanding, but I'll tell you this. There's malignant forces afflicting that man, and it's very hard to get through to him. You know, they're, they're afflicting him bad. And you can see that the spirits that are operating behind that through my brother, uh, it, it's crazy. Um, I love him. He's a beautiful man. And, uh, but, uh, you know, in the world, you know, people don't see it. They see uh, the person. They hear the person. But if you discern between the spiritual realm and the physical realm, you understand what's operating behind it. Um, I'm sharing truth with my brother, and I pray that he gets it, because it's very important, especially in these vital times that we're living in. And we're right at the edge of that. We're right at, right at the edge of the end of this wicked eon. Um, so coming into a realization of the truth is so important. Um, you know, you can come into a realization by somebody telling you and you, you can give them, you can give that person, whoever's coming into the realization of the truth, truth from the scriptures, but they rarely, rarely, rarely go to the actual scriptures and read and study and do anything. Now to grow up in the Lord, I, I, I would say you need to do that because without that, well, you'll be drawn to it anyway. If you have, a, you have an understanding of truth and you have a passion for God and you have a passion to know what he's doing in his universe and not this world, not this crazy, crappy world, your, your focus is on God. So you have a passion for that, you go after it. You can actually discern who is a believer and who is not. And that's what I mean. So, all right. I found this article and I'm going to share this. At the top of the week here, it's called The Divine at the Dais by A. Enoch. And it's an awesome article. I'm going to go through this for a couple of days, so we'll see how it goes. Okay, The Divine at the Dais. God's work is perfect. Ours is a failure. Full of failure. Happy are those who can keep them separate, who do not adulterate his doings with their feeble efforts. Much of human misery comes from the lack of discrimination between the divine and the human sides, or the spiritual and the physical realm. So there you go. The divine and the human sides of salvation in its various aspects. If we mingle these, we do not raise the puny putterings of man to, to the pure perfection of the divine, 
but drag down the glorious achievements of God to the low level of human shortcomings. We must draw a clear line between redemption and ransom, conciliation and reconciliation. Christ's work and our walk, his sufferings for our sins on the cross, and our loss for lack of endurance at the dais. The divine side has practically disappeared in Christendom and has been swallowed up by the human. <clears throat> this distinction comes into sharpest contrast where the same phrase is affirmed and denied. On the divine side, all is out of God. Romans, Romans 11.36 <clears throat> yet, yet our Lord, when speaking of the human aspects, averred that those who do not hear God's declarations are not out of God. John chapter 8, verse 47. The usual reaction is to join the latter class, the latter class and insists that this proves that all is not out of God, even if God himself is, one, is the one who gives a spirit of stupor, eyes not to be observing, and ears not to be hearing. Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 4. Those to whom the Lord spoke were callous by God. Isaiah 29, 10. So that it was out of him that they were not out of him. These two passages occur in entirely different contexts. So it's so important to follow the context, to know who it's speaking to and where, what time and time, place, and who it's speaking to. So the context is so vitally important. One deals with the basic position of God in his universe, the other with temporary human relationships to him. Both are true in their own place but contradictory when cut out of their context. Redemption and ransom. Theology, theology makes no distinction between these two. Hence, the greatest and grandest thoughts connected with the divine side have been branded heresy, because redemption is limited both as to time and extent. Ransom is also contracted without, notwithstanding, the plainest possible passages to the contrary. Because God wills all mankind to be saved. The man Christ Jesus gives himself a ransom for all. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 6. This is the divine side, which should be believed in its own context, not rejected by the human side, is set forth elsewhere. <clears throat> Only believers are redeemed by his soul, which figures his blood that was shed for many. Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. Redemption is clearly limited to time. It ends with the Jubilee. All legal obligations, such as mortgages and slaves, must be redeemed in Israel before the time of expiration. <clears throat> but redemption became imperative or inoperative in the Jubilee because it was not needed. Then it practically became transmuted into ransom. For God had made provision for all to be freed, and for all land to revert to its allottees every half a century. The divine and the human. The great advantage of distinguishing the, the divine from the human side in God's Ionian operations is further heightened when we discover the divine element in the human. This will bring us in us into harmony with the basic truths that all is of God, of Romans 11.36. And the final perfection, when God is manifestly all in every one. Not only in, in ransom, not only is ransom the divine side of redemption and conciliation, God's side of reconciliation. Not e but even at the dais, where the conduct of the saints is especially in view, we may see clearly that it is, it, is, it is God who is operating in us to will as well as to work for the sake of his delight. Philippians 2.13 The divine in redemption. God is not limited in his operations to man's relationship to him. He also controls the acts of men with regard to each other. This is plainly apparent in Israel where he gave them laws which regulated their relationships. No, no other nation could possibly have a law like that of redemption at, and the Jubilee, because this was a type 
of, of the Eonian times, of which man, no man could know apart from revelation. <clears throat> it was God who instituted it in order to reveal his ways. He made it possible for a man to redeem his kin kinsmen in order that their, heart, that their hearts should grasp what he would do for them and the nations through his Messiah, their glorious Redeemer. It was God who arranged matters so that there should be always be poor people among them because the sorrow of loss would be more than compensated by the joy of a redeemed and restored allotment. He gave the famine, which brought Ruth from a foreign land to enjoy redemption at the hand of Boaz. It was God who limited redemption to the period before each jubilee. That man would never have made any such provisions is evident from the fact that in modern, modern theology, this feature is absent. All who are not redeemed are utterly lost, eternally tormented, or hopelessly annihilated, according to orthodoxy. God's idea is just the opposite. Whatever failed to be redeemed in Israel went out free at the Jubilee. Christendom, Christendom knows of no Jubilee, with its joy and exaltation apart from redemption, and has reversed it to, into wailing and gnashing of teeth. It rejects the Jubilee altogether and opposes the plain statements that speak of it as the time when all mankind will be saved and justified and all the universe redeemed. Redemption under, under the law in Israel and under Christ was all the work of God, who alone knew the great lesson which it is intended to teach. It could not be left to men for they did, did not grasp its force. The divine and reconciliation, that fearful travesty of the truth, which misrepresents God as threatening the sinner with eternal torment unless he mends his ways, and which demands of him to pray for mercy and to promise to believe and obey, has almost obliterated the true gospel of God's grace instead of heralding it abroad. No conciliation is possible on the part of the sinner, apart from the previous conciliation on the part of God. The appeasing sacrifice was offered long, long ago. When, when the Savior of Christ's offering of himself ascended into the nostrils of the deity, then it was that he was conciliated to the world. Nothing needs to be added to Christ's sufferings and death to conciliate God. Nothing that the sinner can do will add in the least to his satisfaction, and nothing is needed. Nay, it is offensive to God and delusive for the sinner. But God plays the principal part in reconciliation also. Even when the glorious and gracious truth is presented to an enemy of God, showing that he is conciliated and he is not off and and that he is not offended and he is offering his friendship, nay, that he is actually entreating and beseeching. For Christ's sake, be conciliated to God. Even then, there is no response unless that, that also is due to the, to the power of God's Spirit. Many have heard or read these words, and, and, but have neither understood nor acted upon them. Even in the heralding of the kingdom, a thing which Israel as a whole ardently desired our Lord could say, No one can come to me if ever the Father who sends me should not be drawing him. John chapter 6 44. Okay, there's no free will or decision on man's part on that. And just to reiterate on what conciliation is. God is conciliated with mankind. He is at peace. He is in absolute peace with mankind. You look around you and you see all the chaos and the wicked and evil and you think, okay, well, God's out of control? No, God's in complete control and at peace with mankind. Conciliation is a one-sided peace. And actually, reconciliation occurred with us as members of the body because we were reconciled to God through the conciliation from God. He was at peace with us. So now we're reconciled to him. So it's a two-sided peace. It comes together. Reconciliation for the rest will happen at the, at, at the great white throne and the consummation complete and full. 
Reconciliation means the human will be brought back and he will be at peace with God completely and fully at the consummation. All right. Paul is very bold and says, It is not of him who is willing, nor of him who is racing, but of God the merciful. Romans 9.16 The laudable desire to drag in everybody with the gospel net brings many deluded hypocrites into the so-called quote-unquote church. But unlike the fishermen in the parable, the bad are not cast away. Matthew 13.48 to some extent, even man's methods recognize the fact that men are not able to do anything to save themselves. So they appeal to the soul by music and with promises of earthly and heavenly bliss. Instead of appealing to the spirit by means of God's word, they do not realize that it is not a matter of flesh or of soul, but of spirit. It is not a question of substance or experience, but of life. And life must come from without. A dead man cannot vivify himself. The life is imparted only by God's Spirit through His Word. This should lead us to use His inspired, living, life-giving words alone in our heralding of His Evangel. And that's what I mean. Before you spew it out, you better learn about it. And you better learn from the scriptures and the word of God directly. And he teaches through that word. Trust me. Many years in the scriptures, it comes alive to me. It comes out of the pages to me. I read it. I, I, I go through it. And you, just one verse. You can pick it out and just boom. You get an enlightenment and a realization of God's love and plan and grace. They do the work of saving. Okay, the subject of the evangel for today is neither the sinner nor his sins. The glad news is for him, not about him. Christ and God are the background of the evangel. They do the work of saving. Christ has offered his sacrifice. God is now calling those who he chose long ago before the disruption through his spirit, by his word. So it is even in the human side of salvation. God works in and through his saints to do that which delights him. Okay, so tomorrow I will continue on with the divine in the dais. And the dais is just our seat up or bima seat. I don't like using the word uh, judgment because I won't use it. It is a requital, not a judgment. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's what that means, okay? So when we are there, all that bad's going to be burnt up and all the good will remain. The practices in the body will remain. The good ones, the bad ones will be burnt up. But there's no condemnation. So who would fear the deus of, of God and his Christ? Who would fear it? Telling you, you need to go back to the scriptures and, and, and really dig deep if you're still in fear of God or in fear of any kind of judgment. Stupid. Idiotic. When you become a believer and you really truly believe, you know that there's no condemnation and that you're not going to be judged as the world as the world of Christianity would put it. So there you are. Well, I'm going to enjoy my day in my house. My wife and son, they're home today. Well, my son has to go to school, but my uh, wife will drive him, which is good. I love you all. Have a wonderful day in the Lord. I will see you tomorrow from cold Alberta.